Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us uh, for a virtual trip to Norway with the Traveling Librarian. Uh, join Jeff Claps, the Traveling Librarian, for another of his popular armchair travel presentations. This series highlights travel photography and stories and travel tips about destinations around the world. This month, journey, a journey to Norway, the land of the midnight sun. Um, from the, um, oh boy, a mentally livable capital of Oslo over the mountains to the historic port of Bergen, Norway's scenery is staggering in its beauty. The coastal towns and rural farms nestled in the northern uh, country are not to be missed. Uh, and Jeff, as we all know, is the recently retired head of reference services at the Wakefield Library, the BB Library in Wakefield. And he's, of course, an avid traveler and photographer. So all on uh, 90 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jeff for being <laughs> with us this afternoon. And Jeff, you can take it away. Thanks okay. so much. Thanks for the introduction, Robert. Um, yeah, as uh, as Robert says, as, um, for those of you, I think I think I recognize some names going through the chat. Um, but for those of you who uh, are new uh, to, to these programs, welcome. Um, I have always loved to travel, even while I was still working. Um, and I am also an avid um, amateur photographer, so I try to combine those things um, into these programs. Um, and people seem to like them, so that's why I'm, I'm back again. And I'm glad to see some of you back again as well. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and we'll get started. Uh, there we go. Um, and as was mentioned, if you have any questions uh, as we go through the program, do feel free to pop them into the Q&A. And I'll keep an eye on that and hope to answer uh, as many of them as I can as we go along. Um, but if we miss anything, um, I will certainly uh, catch up with everything at the end of the program. And I also want to mention that um, when Robert sends out email tomorrow, um, uh, he will include my contact information. So if anybody uh, after the program's over, wants to get in touch with me uh, for any other questions about this program or other travel questions in general. I'm always happy to talk to people and hear your stories and your uh, questions, so I'll be happy to talk to you. But let's get started with Norway today. Um, it's it's an interesting place. This is actually a trip I, I took uh, several years ago, although um, I think much of what we're going to talk about today is more or less the same as it was back then. Um, the uh, the country of Norway is only about five million people. It's actually smaller in population than Massachusetts. Um, it is the only country in Scandinavia that does not officially belong to the European Union, um, unless you count Iceland, which is technically part of Scandinavia, but further away. Um, it also, of course, therefore, does not use the euro, um, it uses its own currency. It's, um, as you probably have heard in countless news stories, it has one of the highest standards of living anywhere in the world. Um, and a lot of that is due to its, uh, its political system, also its oil wealth, um, which it is sitting on an awful lot of. Um, it has probably the highest uh, GDP per capita anywhere in the world, except for a couple of those tiny little places like Luxembourg. Um, so it's uh, it's an interesting place to travel in because it's so very different from many other countries that you, you uh, go to, even in Western Europe. Um, another thing that makes it a little bit different is that it is relatively homogeneous um, because it is overwhelmingly ethnic uh, Norwegian. Um, and Northern European. There are a small number, about maybe 2% of um, Laplanders who call themselves Sami. That's the name that they go by. And they live mostly in the very far North. Um, and there's also a number of new immigrants over the past couple of decades. Uh, there've been a lot of immigrants from South Asia, um, places like uh, Pakistan and Iraq and also Bangladesh. Um, and also places like the Balkans in Southern Europe and also Somalia and Africa. And you might wonder why a lot of these people are going there. And of course, part of it is that they're ex uh, escaping difficult circumstances in their own countries. Um, and also because um, there is a good amount of work in the oil industry um, in Norway. And many of these immigrants come uh, for the purpose of taking on what are really quite difficult jobs and often very isolating jobs where they're working on a oil rig for several weeks or months at a time 
so that they can send uh, remitt remittances back to their home countries for their families there. So that has changed a little bit of the demographics, um, but not significantly. You're not going to see, uh, you, you're still talking about maybe a couple of percent out of the entire country, and they tend to be concentrated in certain areas. Um, religiously, it's overwhelmingly Lutheran. In fact, um, you might be surprised to know that for a very progressive liberal kind of country, it actually has a state religion, and that's Lutheranism. Um, but relatively few Norwegians are really observant. It's more of a cultural thing. Um, so only about 10% or even less of, Luther, uh, of, of Lutheran Norwegians, and they tend to be in the older generations, attend church regularly. It really is more of a, a cultural thing. Um, the coastline is huge, and that's one of the main reasons people go to Norway is to see the incredible coastal scenery. Um, to just put it in perspective, it's about 1,600 miles long. Um, and that is longer than the, in, in other words, do I have my pointer here? Yes, I do. Um, in other words, from down here in the in the south all the way up to, if you go up to where it meets the Russian border, that is longer than the entire east coast of the United States, uh, just to put it in perspective. So it's an enormous geographic area. Um, and another thing that's important about it um, is, Norway is uh, extremely mountainous, um, and because of that, there's lots and lots of water flow from uh, uh, both from rain and also from snowmelt. Um, so that provides uh, about 98%, it's an incredible thing, very few countries can say this, uh, uh, of their electricity comes from hydropower. Um, and as you go around uh, Norway, you will see waterfalls like literally every mile or so. Um, so it gives you an idea of why they can do this. Of course, they're also sitting on significant amounts of oil, which much of which they export. This particular trip um, that I took um, actually only touched a, the, the large lump at the bottom of uh, the country. We started in Norway, took the train over to Bergen, which is the second largest city and then drove up the coast to Trondheim and took the train back. You may have heard of the Hurtigruten, which is a, a very popular um, uh, cruise line, originally started as a mailboat service um, that went all the way from Bergen um, up, stopping at countless little hamlets all the way up to the Russian border. And you can still take that, that's incredibly popular. They've added a number of uh, larger ships, so it's, it's kind of gotten away from its original roots uh, of being primarily a mail service. And now it really is a cruise line that happens to drop off um, supplies and mail and other things to people along the way. Um, but it's a great way to see the country. Um, the only disadvantage I would say to, to taking the cruise line is you will see a lot of beautiful coastal scenery, but what you won't see is a lot of the interior scenery. And they're both beautiful. Um, I would love to go back to Norway and, and spend time seeing all the parts I wasn't able to see. Hopefully I'll get to do that at some point. Um, but um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through some of the photographs. And of course you can't miss Oslo, uh, which is where we're gonna start. Um, here we are in Oslo, the capital, um, which is not much bigger than Boston. It's about 800,000 people. It has a much smaller metro area than Boston does, but the the, the central city feels very Boston-like. It's very walkable. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not full of massive skyscrapers. Um, it has a lot of very beautiful walkable uh, neighborhoods and uh, a lot of uh, interesting architecture, a mix of traditional Scandinavian architecture and also very uh, modern uh, facilities like this one. Th this is the Opera House. It, it seems, traveling around Northern Europe, I've discovered that it, it seems almost obligatory these days for any city to um, build a beautiful modern Opera House right on their waterfront. It seems like you just have to do that. When this is Oslo's, um, it was built in 2008 and it is right on the harbor front, so it has great views. You can walk out onto the roof terrace. Um, here's the inside. And it's just, uh, it, it's a beautiful um, 
performance space, but it's also just, uh, it's become kind of a, um, a social meeting place because it's such an architectural icon in the center of the city. But to contrast that, you'll also find a tremendous amount of uh, historical architecture. And although Oslo is a very, very old city, um, a thousand years old, roughly, um, much of the architecture that you will see in the downtown area comes from the late 19th and early 20th century. So there's a lot of Art Nouveau, uh, which is very pretty. You'll see things like this, very traditional styles of um, uh, Scandinavian architecture. It has a very Northern European feel to it. Uh, this is the original stock exchange. Um, so if you've traveled anywhere else in say Northern Germany or the Czech Republic or Austria, any other places like that, you'll you'll definitely get a sense of uh, a northern feel to it. It's very different from Southern Europe. And uh, this is a good example of an Art Nouveau building um, and also a lot of Art Deco, which was built um, in the decades following uh, uh, the Art Deco period, This uh, uh, the Art Nouveau period. Here's, here's a beautiful building that has um, paintings on the outside. Many of the buildings have very steep um, tiled roofs, um, which makes sense in a climate that gets significant snowfall in the winter. This is one of the um, best known buildings in town. This is called the Grand Hotel, and it is indeed quite grand. Uh, it was built in the 1870s. And it's not only a, a very nice place to stay if you can afford it, um, but it's also famous for the fact that every year when the Nobel Peace Prize is awarded in Oslo and they have all the big ceremonies, uh, this is where the guests um, and the, uh, the winners of the prize stay and where the big ceremonies and banquets are held. Uh, we treated ourselves to, ourselves to one night when we were there, just so we could say we stayed there. And it is a gorgeous place to stay. Um, but I do have to say throughout all of Norway when we traveled there, and it really hasn't changed that much. Uh, Norway is an incredibly expensive place to travel and you need to be prepared for that when you go there. Um, it was worse for us when we were there because we just happened to travel just, it was just bad luck that we were there when the exchange rate um, between uh, the US dollar and a lot of the European currencies, including the Euro, um, were just about as bad as they could be. But um, Norway is just a generally expensive place uh, to travel anyway, as are most of the Scandinavian countries. So you kind of have to be prepared for that when you go. Um, this is the Storting, which is the parliament building from uh, 1814. Um, and just a few other beautiful buildings from downtown uh, Oslo. This is the Hard Rock Cafe, if you can believe it. Um, and Oslo University. Much of the buildings that I'm, many of the buildings I'm showing you are on one of the, on or near one of the main drags through the city. This um, main avenue goes east-west, um, starts over in the west at the at the, um, the Royal Palace and works its way all the way through the city down to the waterfront. And it's, it's a gorgeous street full of um, historic buildings and uh, major monuments. There's a wonderful old public market um, from the 19th century that is still used for that purpose today. Uh, the National Theater, um, Benetton. <laughs> you will find, of course, all of the usual um, international chains in Oslo. Um, but to look at some of the more specific sites, probably the most famous thing to, um, to, to visit in the city is the Akershus Fortress, which um, is in the inner harbor and is one of the oldest structures in the city. It was built in the 13th century and is currently used for um, offices for the prime minister. Um, but it is a museum, you can visit it. Um, and it has fantastic views out over the inner harbor, which has been significantly redeveloped um, with uh, very fancy condos and restaurants and shops and so forth. 
um, but the very old uh, fortress itself is a wonderful place to explore. If you happen to travel with children, it's a great place for them um, because it really is just a big castle with lots of um, moats and drawbridges and uh, and it's built high on a bluff so you get to see out over the uh, the harbor. Here's one of the interior courtyards. And much of the interior does still retain its beautiful medieval um, look. It's been restored. So there's a lot of gorgeous interiors um, that look exactly the way they did when the building was originally built, including this fantastic banquet hall. Um, if you stroll around this harbor area, you'll see all of this trendy development. Um, there's, um, it's kind of the, the equivalent of like the Quincy Market area of Boston, where everything's been turned into fancy, um, very expensive condominiums and uh, hotels. Um, but even if you don't enjoy any of that, um, it's just a great place to walk. There's a, a gorgeous boardwalk that you can take. There are also a number of boat rides um, that will take you into the fjord and uh, to some of the other places. We'll talk about those in a minute. And the strange building that you can see in the back, which I'll show you in more detail in just a moment, is Oslo City Hall. There's also um, this, what used to be a train station um, that was converted at some point into the Nobel Peace Center. So this is uh, a museum uh, to the Nobel Prize, the history of the Nobel Prizes. Um, which if you're interested in that at all, it's a, a very nicely done museum and the building is beautiful. But I think even more interesting is the city hall, which it's kind of like city hall in Boston. People either love it or hate it. Um, it's an interesting architectural style, um, very much of its era. It was built between the 1930s and the 1950s. Um, the construction was interrupted by World War II. Um, and it's a it, it's an unusual building because it really um, it has that sort of you know there there was no WPA in um, in uh, Norway of course that was an American thing but there still is a look and feel to things that were designed and built in the 1930s um, that is almost international you can really see that as you go through this building um, the tower on the right actually has quite a fantastic set of bells that you can hear um, periodically through the day. Um, and you can tour City Hall, where you can see um, the interior decoration, which again, very much looks like it's from the 1930s and has some beautiful details. You also can see the main hall, which is where um, there are these gorgeous murals depicting the history of Norway, um, the history of the labor movement in Norway. Again, this was the 1930s. And also uh, Norway under occupation, uh, because this also was construction happened when uh, World War II was going on. So people tend to forget that Norway was actually part of World War II. Um, and a lot of uh, there, it was occupied by the Nazis. A lot of bad things happened there. We'll see some of that also as we go on. Um, but the, the building itself is, is just gorgeous. And every December, I think it's the 10th of December, the, the, the international ceremony where the Nobel Peace Prize is awarded um, is held here in this, in this great hall that we're looking at. But you can explore the whole building on your own. Um, you can take a guided tour if you want, or you can just look at it on your own. And it's just such an unusual place. Um, and it looks out right onto the Akersus, which you can see on the, the bluff just opposite on the other side of the, um, the harbor. If you like strolling, Oslo is a wonderful place to stroll around because as um, I mentioned before, it's not too big. Um, it doesn't have, it doesn't feel overwhelming like a lot of um, bigger European cities like Paris or London or New York. Um, we happen to be there in May, uh, late May which luckily was the time when lilacs were in bloom and the entire city is just covered with lilacs, um, some of which are tree-sized. <laughs> uh, 
um, and that made it um, a delightful place to stroll. And you also get to see a lot of really interesting and um, very beautiful traditional Scandinavian architecture. Um, and I'm going to take you just briefly across the harbor. You can take a lot of nice boat trips around the fjord. Um, there is a peninsula right across from the downtown area called Bigdoy, um, where I guess you could call it the probably the the Beacon Hill of Oslo. Let's put it that way. It's a very um, upscale neighborhood, um, the toniest part of the city. But it's also um, nice to visit because it has some of the um, city's best museums. Um, and you can easily spend half a day, if not an entire day, um, enjoying the museums and just strolling around and looking at the beautiful neighborhoods. One of the museums is the Viking Ship Museum, which isn't terribly large, but has some uh, amazing uh, Viking artifacts in it. There are three Viking ships um, and a number of other archaeological finds from the Viking era. Um, here's one of them here. And um, you can see some of the, if I, on the right, you'll see the, the detail of some of the Viking style carvings. Um, but to see Viking ships that were unearthed um, in their entirety, um, uh, preserved because they were um, underwater, under uh, mud and silt and so forth that uh, because there was no oxygen, it actually protected the wood so that a thousand years later, they actually are in surprisingly good condition. And to see them actual size um, up close is, is quite impressive. And here's some examples of some of those uh, elegant style homes. You'll notice there's a lot of, it's uh, wooden architecture more so than stone. Um, Southern Europe tends to have lots of stone houses because that's what they have. Northern Europe, particularly Scandinavia, tends to have wooden houses because they have trees. Boy, do they have trees. So uh, the traditional architecture tends to be more um, made of wood. Often you'll see this vertical uh, board and batten style, um, almost barn look. Um, and uh, they have uh, ceramic tile roofs very often or metal roofs that are designed to shed the snow and ice as um, efficiently as possible. Another of the famous museums in this area is the Kontiki Museum. And I'm sure you've all heard of Thor Heyerdahl um, and his uh, Pacific explorations. Um, he's one of the fam most famous Norwegians, at least of the 20th century, um, and they're very proud of him. And so there are uh, originals and replicas of his uh, craft um, in this museum. So you can actually see very close up what the, the boats were that he, he used to go literally thousands of miles across the Pacific in this thing that's only, you know, barely 30 feet long. And of course, there's a lot of um, history about uh, his background, his life. Um, but if you're interested in any of that uh, adventure stories, um, it's a fun museum uh, to visit. It includes both the original Kontiki ship and also the Ra 2, which was one of his later voyages. See that here. Um, up in the hills near Oslo, this is an example of uh, another kind of traditional architecture. This is a hotel, a very fancy one, um, at the ski jump that's um, just on the outskirts of the city. And even though we were there um, outside of ski season, it was kind of fun to go. Um, it's called the Holman Cullen Olympic Ski Jump, um, which they still use today for all kinds of activities, even things that have nothing to do with the Olympics. Um, and it's probably the only time in my life because I don't ski. Um, and if I did, it would probably not, it would not end well, I'm sure. Um, but you can actually take the elevator all the way to the top of this ski jump. And here is the view 
um, that you would see if you were a skier. Um, and in the winter, this would be covered with, covered with snow and ice and you would go sailing down this. Um, the arced area that you see in the background is the viewing stands for the spectators. And uh, of course, this would all be filled with snow and you would go shooting off this um, and land somewhere down here. Um, here is a model of what it would look like uh, during actual ski season. So you, but you can actually stand right at the top and get a Olympic skier's eye view without having to actually do it um, of what it would be like to go down a ski jump. If you're afraid of heights, I probably wouldn't recommend it, but it's pretty cool. And there's also a, a museum about the Olympics and um, the history of the jump and so forth. It's, makes a nice excursion just out of the city. Um, here we are back downtown, wandering around the central area, looking at, again, all of the lilacs, just incredible. Summer is not surprisingly the best time to visit um, Scandinavia because the weather is the nicest. Um, the sun is up until very, very late at night um, and rises early in the morning. So you have daylight for probably 20 hours of the day, at least. Um, and uh, the flowers are out. It's just a generally nicer time to be there. Um, if you're interested in history, uh, this is the oldest church in the city. Um, and just next to it is a, uh, one of the city cemeteries with some famous Norwegians, such as Henrik Ibsen, if you're into literature. And another thing that's absolutely no miss if you go to Oslo um, over in the west end of the city is uh, Frogner Park, which even if you only spend half an hour just quickly running through it, you, you really should not miss it. It is the most bizarre collection of sculptures you'll see in almost any European city. Uh, in between, say, 1924 and 1943, three, give or take, like the, the early part uh, of World War II. Um, a sculptor named Gustav Wiegeland um, created this park, uh, which is huge. And, oh, dear, excuse me. My neighbors have decided um, to start mowing their lawn, so I'm going to try and close my window. Um, There we go. I hope that reduces any of the background. Um, so here are the main gates to it. And Vigeland had a very uh, unusual style. And you may notice that some of some of the style of these sculptures, uh, because they were built, uh, created again at the same time as the Oslo City Hall, they have that sort of 1930s, early 20th century feel to them. Um, but he also injects a lot of whimsy in, into his sculptures. So there are some that are out of granite, um, some are uh, bronze. And the idea behind most of them is to depict the widest possible um, range of human emotion, I guess is how you would uh, describe it. Joy, sadness, um, fear, family, uh, different ages. Um, it's, it's an absolutely incredible place. And I think part of it is because the entire park is based on one artist's work. So the whole place was designed by this one guy. Um, it's not a mishmash of things um, pulled together haphazardly. Um, all of the work is his. It was done within a relatively short period of time. Um, and designed as a whole. So you can see the whole range of the human condition. Um, and here's a pile, of, an interesting pile of babies. The, um, the central focus of the park is this column uh, called the monolith, which looks kind of like a totem pole and has 36 different groups of figures all stacked on top of each other. Um, and if you can believe it, it was made from a single block of stone. 
Um, but again, there's just this huge variety of things. So um, we went twice, both uh, our initial visit to uh, Oslo and then when we returned to the city at the end of our um, travels around the country. Um, and it's it's absolutely a no miss. Um, even if you're only in Oslo for a day, you have to go here. We were lucky enough uh, to be in the city on May 17th, which is their national um, celebration, their what they call Constitution Day. Um, and it commemorates the signing of the Norwegian Constitution in 1814 when they declared independence from the Kingdom of Denmark. So it's it was kind of fun to be there. Uh, the weather didn't cooperate terribly well. It was a bit uh, a bit rainy, um, but they block off all the downtown area. There are Norwegian flags um, hanging from every window and every flagpole. Um, everybody's out in uh, traditional dress. This is looking past the uh, the building on the left is the Parliament building, and it looks through this main road all the way up the hill. Uh, to the building that you can see in the off in the distance, which is the the royal palace. Um, the prime minister gives a speech. Everyone comes out. There are parades, bands, lots of people in um, traditional costume. The other thing that was going on at this particular time of year was graduation from school because it's the end of the school year. And we discovered that uh, Norwegian teenagers, I guess when they graduate, they, there is a traditional costume of red sweatpants um, and they just go wild throughout the town. They get drunk, they drive, <laughs> they, they're all over the city um, having fun. And of course this coincided with the national festival. so. Um, it was kind of a fun way to see uh, Norwegians having about as much fun as they do all year. Um, note even the little dog here who has his traditional outfit on. And of course, the royal family um, came out and addressed the crowd. You can see them up on the balcony. We took the opportunity on this particular day to visit another of the major museums that's um, well worth a visit, um, partly because um, it was a nice thing to spend the afternoon doing and partly because it was free. Everything in Oslo is free um, on Constitution Day. So we visited the Norska uh, Folk Museum, which is on that same uh, island where the Kontiki Museum um, is. And it's maybe a 10 minute boat ride across the harbor. Um, and this is another place where if you don't have much time in Norway, if you um, have to whiz through very quickly, um, I would highly recommend this because it gives you um, uh, an overview of the styles of uh, architecture and uh, both public buildings and private homes throughout all over the country and different time periods all in one relatively small space, um, kind of like uh, it, it's a Sturbridge village kind of place. So it's a collection of historic buildings from all over Norway that were moved here. And I should emphasize, these are not replicas. These are actual original structures that were, for whatever reason, in danger um, and of being torn down or falling apart. So they were moved to this museum for preservation. This particular one is a 12th century stave church from uh, much further north in Norway. And uh, it, is, it is pretty good size. There's, I don't know how many acres it is, um, but you could easily spend half a day just wandering around looking at these particular buildings. Um, here's a good example of a uh, private home. And many of these uh, traditional uh, rural buildings are examples of what uh, people would have lived in at, in centuries in the past um, and in other parts of Norway, particularly up in the north. Um, the A lot of them have these elevated, um, they're kind of like on, on stilts, which seems kind of unusual, except there's there's a couple of very practical reasons for that. 
Um, first of all, um, it helps to protect the house from vermin, like rats and, and so forth that might try to get into the house. Also, in any climate where there's a significant snowfall, um, it helps to elevate the house um, above some of that snowfall for part of the year. And it also, um, basically during the winter when the weather is worst and the snow is all around the outside of the house, it creates its own uh, storage space, uh, which is completely climate controlled. <laughs> so you can actually store um, food in a protected area underneath the floor of the house uh, during the coldness of the winter. Um, you'll also see a lot of homes with sod roofs like this, which also, again, has a very practical purpose. Um, it um, helps to protect the roof during the winter months. Um, it's very well insulating. And it also, when it's torrentially raining, um, you don't hear the rain <laughs> on the roof as much because it's not hitting tile or metal. Um, so that's long been a, a very traditional way. And you'll even see that in, in modern recently built houses in rural Norway. And of course, a lot of the traditional um, style of design, um, which you can see in metalwork and um, fabric and clothing and also in wood carving um, is very evident in a lot of these buildings. Um, and because it was the national holiday, um, they had races and events and sack races and all kinds of fun stuff like that. It was it was a fun day to um, see the Norwegians out enjoying themselves. And the weather did actually clear up, which was good. Um, by the afternoon, it was much nicer. And so we spent much of the day just wandering around this um, architectural museum. It even goes up right up to the 20th century. So you'll see buildings like this that were built in the 19th and, and 20th century. Um, complete reconstructions of villages from, from other parts of, of the country. Um, back in the city, here's the Royal Palace again with slightly nicer weather. And a view from the palace looking the opposite direction back down this main drag. Uh, again, you can see the Parliament building there and the port is the the harbor is kind of off in the distance behind it's called uh carl johansgata should you be interested in the details um and he was uh it's named after him because he was one of the very important 19th century kings after norway got its independence from denmark i liked stumbling upon this um little tableau where um a guy was photographing a very modern, uh, contemporary, voluptuous Norwegian young woman while one of the, the older traditional costumed women would happen to be going by. But now let's leave Oslo because I know you want to see a lot of scenery and there's plenty of that. Um, so what we did for the rest of the trip is we took the train over the mountains from uh, Oslo to Bergen, which takes about oh, four hours or so. Um, that's about a like a 500 mile trip um and uh i'm sorry the the forget what i said um the 500 miles is actually the red line here that goes all the way up to trondheim um the the trip from oslo to bergen is considerably shorter and is maybe a half day half day trip so what we did is we ended up in bergen and then drove and you can see uh a lot of the coastal scenery if you drive, but it also, um, I, I recommend getting inland a little bit into the mountains because there really is some spectacular scenery there as well. Um, and then we ended up in Trondheim, which is sort of the gateway to the north um, and uh, took the train back down to Oslo. Um, the, the train that goes from Oslo to Bergen goes over some of the highest mountains in the country and of course, you can see here, even though it was May, um, there was plenty of snowpack when you get up high. Um, and as you come down into uh, descend the mountains into the valley where Bergen is um, on its fjords, the scenery changes and starts becoming much more of the traditional, the, the typical coastal scenery that you're used to seeing 
um, guidebook photos of um, of Norway. Um, I'm noticing uh, in one of the uh, one someone asked a a question in the Q and A. Uh, do Norwegians speak English? Oh, absolutely. Um, in fact, they speak it better than most Americans. <laughs> I have to say, um, Scandinavians uh, all learn English as a second language in school and from a very young age, and their their English is impeccable. Even when you get out into uh, rural Norway, some of the older generations may not speak it quite as well, but certainly anybody under the age of, say, 50 um, in anywhere anywhere in the country is going to speak um, absolutely perfectly good English. Um, it's certainly fun and polite to learn a little Norwegian, um, at least being able to say please and thank you and uh, things like that. Um, but uh, Norwegian is certainly not necessary to travel anywhere in Norway, um, particularly if you are not out in the middle of nowhere, if you're if you're in any of the major cities or traveling in any of the tourist areas. English is everywhere. Um, Bergen, um, again, this is one of those places where if if you're not able to spend uh, two weeks or something traveling around the whole country, um, you must not miss Bergen. In fact, I would probably see Bergen before I would see Oslo if I had the choice. Um, it's the second largest city um, after Oslo and still pretty good size. There's about 300,000 people there, so it's not a tiny little town. Um, it's also a very big university city and a major port. It's the starting point for most of the cruise lines um, that cruise the Norwegian coast. And it's an absolutely stunning city. Um, we stayed uh, in a like a guest house um, in the university quarter, um, which is full of gorgeous Victorian architecture like this. Um, the city is is actually quite old. Um, it goes back about a thousand years. Um, and it was an important part uh, during the Renaissance of the Hanseatic. And um, so it, it has long had a very outsized influence in uh, uh, it, it punches above its weight. Let's let's put it that way. And it always has. Um, nowadays, it's doing that as a, a cruise port and as a tourist destination. But it always was a major um, uh, economic powerhouse in northern Europe. But it is probably one of the most beautiful European cities. Um, that you will see um, certainly in Scandinavia. It's kind of in a, it's it's on a fjord, but um, the the downtown area is kind of in a little hollow that um, has hills on either side. And the architecture is stunning. It's a very tidy city, a very um, walkable city. And all of it is centers around uh, the harbor the historic harbor, but also the modern harbor, which is where a lot of the cruise ships come in. So you will see a lot of the old commercial buildings that were used for um, shipping uh, as far back as uh, the founding of the city um, in the Middle Ages. There's a fortress um, that you can visit at the end. And um, a very uh, popular area, probably the the most historic part of the city is this little um, section where a lot of the original um, customs buildings and uh, shipping houses are right down on the waterfront. Um, even the McDonald's, th this is actually a McDonald's fast food restaurant, which um, Bergen being the kind of place it is, does not allow them to do the kind of uh, exterior decorating that they might want to. So it's a very subdued McDonald's. Um, but um, there are a lot of pedestrian streets. And I would recommend if you have the time um, to either hike up to the little hilltop that overlooks the city, or you can take a funicular if you um, aren't up to, um, to the hike. And here you can see the entire central area of the city on its fjord, which is quite protected. One of the reasons why Bergen is such a uh, an important historic port is that it's on the ocean, um, but it is 
quite well protected from the open ocean. Um, so the worst of the storms um, never could actually get in to affect the city, yet it has very quick and easy access to the open ocean. Um, but uh, you will see cruise ships here, big and small. The Hurtigruten starts from here to head north, um, along with a lot of local excursions. But you also can see um, an excellent view of the whole downtown port area, including here up at the top, um, these long uh, wooden buildings that are the oldest part of the commercial port going back to the Renaissance. Um, we were only in Bergen for, I think, two days, and I could easily have spent uh, two or three more. There's a number of excellent museums. Um, there are uh, things to see outside uh, the city. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful spot. Um, it has a traditional uh, Northern European market hall, uh, guild hall, like uh, a number of other nor Northern European countries have still being used as a market. And this is that uh, hilltop that I was talking about that you can either hike up or um, take a funicular. And it's a beautiful, if you wanna just get out into nature, it's a beautiful forest park. Uh, there's also some terrific um, markets, especially for fish. Um, if you get up early enough, you can catch the fish market that has all kinds of interesting things to see including, uh, this is klipfisk. You may have heard of lutefisk, which is similar. Um, there's a lot of dried fish, which um, I'm not a particular fan of myself, um, but um, it goes back a long way because of course, if you live in a country that relies on fish to get you through the winter, um, salting and um, preserving fish to get you through a very cold winter is one of the best ways to not starve. Um, so, of course, nowadays it's just a, a kind of niche marketing thing that is more of a just a historic delicacy than something that people actually eat very frequently. But you can find it in a lot of the markets. Um, and again, here is the downtown port area, with uh, which is known as the Brugge uh, Historic District. So there are some uh, later buildings that are in brick or stone, and then the oldest structures are in wood. All the way along the waterfront. Some of them are a little askew. If you look at them, <laughs> you can see just how old they are. Um, and a number of other, again, just similar to Oslo, there are some wonderful neighborhoods um, with very expensive residential districts, um, much of which is around the university. So some of these buildings are actually university buildings, um, housing for faculty and uh, other things related to uh, Bergen University. There's even a part down um, on the southern part of the harbor that has these uh, very traditional wooden buildings that almost reminded me a little of New England. There are um, places like Portsmouth, New Hampshire and Newport that have uh, just small wooden um, port houses like this. Uh, that was kind of interesting, reminded me of home. So we left Bergen and um, took a day trip, which I would highly recommend. Again, if you don't have a lot of time in Norway, um, this uh, day tour is something that I would very much recommend, even though it sounds kind of cheesy. It's called Norway in a Nutshell. Um, and it sounds like uh, a kind of touristy day tour, um, which it is. But on the other hand, it's excellent. <laughs> Um, and if you don't have the opportunity to travel around on your own, it is a way of seeing some of the most dramatic scenery um, very close to Bergen. Uh, you can actually do it either from Oslo or Bergen in one day. Um, and uh, if it, it gives you a little bit of the fjords and a little bit of the mountains. Um, so if you're only in Norway for a few days, um, this is a way of seeing some of the dramatic scenery. 
and what what um, you can do it in a couple of different directions. We started here that you take a train from uh, from Bergen and you start in a tiny town called Myrdal and take a um, one of those uh, very steep trains that goes all the way down to a tiny little village called Flum. And then you get on a boat to see some incredible um, fjord scenery and then uh, take a bus back up to the train um, here. So the whole thing is maybe a half day trip um, and getting to and from. Uh, and it's on a branch of the Sogne Fjord, which we'll see a little later. The Sogne Fjord is one of the largest fjords in the world um, and is the largest in Norway. Um, so you're just on a little branch of this. Um, so the, the train um, to, from Myrdal to Flam, which is about 22 kilometers, is uh, one of the steepest train tracks in the world. And here's the train with its um, snow plow in the front. And it works its way down kind of like a cog railway down this incredibly steep incline and through a couple of tunnels you stop at um, some very powerful waterfalls along the way to to see the views into this gorgeous valley um, where the village of Flum is. Flum is is very tiny only a couple hundred people um, again here's a, a close-up of the snow plow um, for if you happen to be doing this in the winter. Um, but Flum is a uh, very picturesque, typical Norwegian village, um, which at one point before the train would have been completely isolated. Many of the Norwegian villages that you might go to today um, used to be accessible only by boat, and of course only by boat during certain times of year. Um, something that you learn as you, as you go through some of these fjord areas is just how varied the climate is. Uh, in Norway. Um, climate is often uh, affected as much by the topography and the elevation as it is by latitude and longitude. So even though Norway is very far north, there are some interesting microclimates um, in these little valleys where um, uh, this little bridge um, is, uh, there's a lot of fishing in this little valley. Um, but there's also a lot of uh, fruit trees grown in different parts of Norway in places where you just wouldn't expect it um, because you'd think it would be too cold for there to be apple trees and even apricots and um, uh, almond trees and other kinds of fruit trees that you would think would just not survive in a climate like this. Well, in a few places they do, not large scale. Um, but in a lot of these tiny little um, valleys, um, it's, it is almost like seeing Shangri-La. It's this beautiful, isolated little jewel of a village. Um, here's the church, uh, which is from 1670. Um, and the interior is very traditional Scandinavian wooden style with folk painting. Uh, here is an old... Uh, house with a sod roof that's gotten a little out of control. They may want to, <laughs> they may want to do some um, hacking away at the trees. Um, again, here you can see apple trees, bluebells blooming. Um, in the spring, um, sheep farming, sheep and goats are widespread throughout Norway, and you can see it was lambing season. And from Flum, you get uh, the next part of this, this day trip is to get on a um, boat that will take you through some fjord country, two of the big fjords um, in this area. One's called Arlands Fjord, and the other is Neroy Fjord. And again, we are not very far from Bergen, uh, nor are we very far from Oslo, but the scenery is absolutely among some of the most beautiful that you will see anywhere in the country. Um, you pass by a number of little villages like this, small fishing villages. And uh, here are some of the countless waterfalls that um, are all over the country um, that help to 
support its hydroelectric um, powering. Um, you can see just a little isolated sheep farm down here at the bottom. Um, and the cliffs that you're looking at here are anywhere from two to, in some cases, 4,000 feet high. Um, and if you can imagine the fjord underwater, um, the landscape continues below the water. So most fjords are also uh, at a minimum several hundred feet deep, if not um, up to a couple thousand in some places. And when you end your little boat trip, you stop in a town called uh, Stahlheim and then take the bus um, back up. The, the Stahlheim Valley was one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. It's, uh, it makes you think of the Lord of the Rings movies. Um, it's just incredibly dramatic scenery um, and um, very lush and forested. Whoops. Um, and then um, at that point, uh, we left um, Bergen on our own with a rental car and drove all the way up to Trondheim, meander and our way across the fjords. Um, Sogne Fjord, which is the longest fjord in Norway, 127 miles long, and at its deepest point, it is 4,000 feet deep. <laughs> um, it's one of the longest uh, in the world. I think uh, the only other longer fjords are actually in um, Antarctica, as I recall. Uh, here's a map just to kind of um, give you an idea of how it's organized. Um, Bergen is just off the bottom of this map and Sogne Fjord uh, goes all the way <laughs> um, and breaks off into a number of other little fjords, including the two that that um, day trip goes to, which are little branches off the side. To travel around by car um, is actually not as hard as you might think because there are ferries everywhere. If there isn't a bridge, there's a ferry um, or a tunnel. And Norway certainly has had the money to build out a lot of that infrastructure, um, and they continue to do so. Um, it uh, cuts the driving time significantly. Obviously, if you had to drive all the way around a 120-mile fjord, it would take a lot of extra time. But in 30 minutes, you can hop on a ferry um, and be across the fjord um, in no time. Um, the ferries are, you don't have to reserve them in advance. You just pull up um, and usually you can see where the ferry is. It just, they just go back and forth. Um, and if it's not ready for you, you can probably see it on the other side of the fjord and you just wait for it to come back. Um, and there is a toll, but they're um, just like there would be a toll on some bridges or tunnels. Uh, but here is uh, uh, just some examples of what the interior, when you get a little bit away from the coast, there is the most gorgeous scenery. Um, many of these are fjords that are connected to the open ocean, but they are uh, miles and miles away from it. Lots of small villages. We stayed in a tiny town called Strin. Um, in, uh, this is an old hotel, not the hotel we stayed in. This one was actually um, closed down for the season, um, but another good example of the typical Norwegian style architecture from uh, from the Victorian period. And um, by getting away from the coast, we were able to try out a little hiking um, that was fun. This is um, Brikstal, which is part of the largest ice cap on the European mainland, that the, the bottom bulb of Norway, the, where, where it becomes fat at the bottom. The whole center of that is an ice cap. Um, and one little tongue of that um, off of the Jostedal glacier is called Riksdal. Uh, dal is a Norwegian word that I think means valley, essentially. Um, and uh, it's one of the places where you can do relatively not strenuous hiking um, and get very close to some of the, the glaciers. Here I am pointing out the glacier. It's not huge, but it's, um, it's an honest to God glacier tongue. Um, the, the ice cap in some places is over 6,000 feet high, and the ice is over 1,000 feet thick. Um, I, it, it might occur to you, because certainly um, you're hearing about this in a lot of other parts of the world, that glaciers are melting. 
um, around the world. And that is absolutely true um, in Norway as well as other places. Um, the, the retreating glaciers are a significant problem, not only because of tourism, it's just sad to see them go away. Um, they say, for example, that Glacier National Park here in um, on the border of the US and Canada out in uh, Montana, I guess it is, um, they expect that within 20 to 30 years, there won't actually be any glaciers left in Glacier National Park. Um, but it also has significant uh, ramifications for um, the environment and the economy. Much of the um, hydroelectric power that Norway gets um, is due to melting ice that comes down after the winter snows. Um, the ice pack and the snow pack melt, um, and that creates rivers and waterfalls that help create hydropower. The same is true out in um, western the western United States. Um, and so it's not just that pretty glaciers are disappearing, it's that it could have a significant impact on water supplies um, for irrigation and for power as well. So um, it's, it's alarming. Um, and even in a country that is as progressive and climate conscious as Norway is, um, they are not immune from these kinds of things because climate change is not uh, concerned about political borders, so they have to deal with it as well. Um, but for the time being, the glaciers um, are still there, and it's a great way to get up, up close and personal with them and get a little bit out in, into nature. Um, Norway, um, as you would expect with all this water, is very, very green. And um, so there's moss and trees, and um, we were there during dandelion season. Um, and it was, it was interesting to note that the Norwegians do not care about dandelions. They aren't out there trying to kill them. Um, they take over acres and acres of grass, and they're very useful because they provide something for the sheep to eat. Um, and it was fun to see the lambs cavorting around in the, in the fields of flowers. Um, a little further up um, is, I'm going to show you uh, here, you can see my pointer, Geirandrfjord, which is here, um, is a long way from the ocean, but it is actually connected to the open ocean. Um, and if you have ever seen a guidebook, a calendar, any image of Norway and its fjords, it was probably uh, Geirandrfjord that you saw the picture of, and you'll definitely recognize it in a couple of minutes when I show it to you. Um, we took the car, um, we had actually driven up here to a tiny town called Hellesfjord and took a car ferry um, down to the other end of the fjord. But many people visit this fjord on cruise ships, um, which come uh, from the outside, and even very, very large cruise ships can, can enter this fjord because it's large enough. Um, and because it's so popular, almost any uh, Norwegian cruise line, Princess Cruise Line, all of those places um, will definitely make a stop at, at this fjord because it is so picturesque. Um, so here is Hellesilk, the little town that we stopped in, which has a massive waterfall that comes down through the middle. Um, very typical small town with a church, lots of wooden buildings. Um, the Grand Hotel, which was not terribly grand, uh, and I, in fact, I think it was closed at the time. But the view from Hellasil up the um, uh, the fjord is uh, towards the east is stunning. So we were here. We are waiting for the ferry to come along. Um, so we drove onto the car ferry, and you get an incredible um, view as you're going up the fjord to the the tiny town of Gyron. Um, this is another one of those uh, little microclimates I mentioned that many of the trees that you can see are here are actually um, uh, almond trees, which you would never imagine would grow in a place like um, northern Norway, but um, on this tiny farm they do. Um, apricots, cherries are another thing that you see there. Um, and there are many waterfalls along the route. And again, these incredibly steep cliffs. 
anywhere from two, three, four thousand feet high. And when you get to the end, um, the town at the very extreme eastern end um, is pretty small. There's only about 200 people um, in the in the town, but they get up to a million visitors per year, almost all of whom come uh, by cruise ship and most of which come in the summer. Um, in fact, after Bergen, this is the, sing the second largest uh, cruise port in the country. Um, and to give you an idea of scale, this is one of those mega cruise ships um, that you see cruising the Caribbean and the Mediterranean and all of the rest of the world. Um, this, I think, was our ferry um, on its way back, car ferry, its way back um, down the fjord. Um, and I want to point out also here this road, um, which is how you, if you're uh, going by car, this is how you leave. <laughs> Um, so if, if you're not good with driving on steep cliffs, this may not be the best place for you, but the views when we left going up that road are quite incredible. Um, it's, it's a pleasant little town. Here's um, a church up high, typical Norwegian church. Um, the town, it's the, the downtown area is a little drab. It mostly has just a couple of small hotels. Um, here's David on the cliff, just to give you some scale. Um, and this is the uh, exact same view uh, from our hotel room in the morning. Um, so it's same view, but completely different light. And of course, when you've got an incredibly steep valley with thousand foot cliffs, the, the light is quite dramatic. And uh, here we are leaving on that. Um, road. It's called Eagle Road for obvious reasons. Um, so this is looking back at um, the little village. There was a, uh, another way to get to Geironger. You can drive over this mountain pass um, from the, uh, down from the south, but um, because of avalanches, it was actually closed uh, when we were there, which was kind of unusual um, in, in May for that to happen. Um, but they had had some storms um, that caused some problems, so we had to go around the long way. And another view looking back up, um, or I'm sorry, down, um, Geironger Fjord back towards uh, where we took the car ferry from. You can see these cliffs are a couple thousand feet, literally just straight down a wall of granite. And again, this is a fjord, so if you can picture under the water, it's just as uh, steep and deep um, as, as the landscape is above. Um, I would love to go back here at some point because there are some amazing hiking trails that actually go along these cliffs. Um, you can hike from one end of Geironger Fjord to the other on some marked paths, hiking trails, um, and the scenery and views must be just mind boggling. Um, typical mailbox, um, even the mailboxes have sod roofs on. Um, the next place that I would recommend stopping if you're in this area is a gorgeous historic port. Um, not terribly big, it's maybe the size of, oh, Salem, give or take, Salem, Beverly, um, small port city. Um, called Olesund, um, and you can see how far it is out on these little spits of land um, um, and the fjords. Um, in fact, if you go down this fjord here and head off to the east is where you get back to Geirama, where we just were, um, but you can drive out to, to Olesund. And um, what makes Olesund interesting is actually its architecture. Um, and its canals and its architecture is, um, the history of it is interesting because it only exists because of a massive um, natural disaster. In 1904, the entire town was destroyed by a fire. Um, this ha happened actually in a number of places um, in Scandinavia because so many of the buildings were built of wood and fire all over the world at that time period was always a danger. And so 
the vast majority of the buildings in the town were destroyed. Um, and then they completely rebuilt the town um, over the next few years. And it happened to be the time period when uh, the era when Art Nouveau was all the rage. So from about 1904 to 1907, 1908, the entire town rebuilt itself in stone um, to protect from future fires. And it was built almost uh, uniformly in the Art Nouveau style. So it's almost like an outdoor museum of Art Nouveau buildings. Um, and you will see uh, there's also, it, it's all surrounded by water, which makes it almost feel like you're strolling around Venice. Um, so there are these beautiful buildings. Um, it's another very wealthy touristy town, um, although it is a working port. Um, but they get a lot of tourism and many of the oldest uh, commercial buildings that were originally used for shipping have now been converted into pricey condos. Um, but there are gorgeous details on all of the buildings. They even have their own theater. And uh, a lot of beautiful streets with uh, some of which are pedestrianized. This is all in the downtown area. Um, and um, like many of the towns in Norway, there's always a bump, a little hill that you can climb up to to get a, a, a nice view. So this park in the center of town, um, it, it's a public park, but it has a, uh, a little Belvedere at the top that gives you a beautiful view looking, um, we're looking west out towards the open ocean. Um, so you can see um, the central city here. And all along this canal, um, you can see the original uh, mercantile buildings that would have been used uh, to uh, load and unload ships. most of which have now been converted into hotels, condos, that sort of thing. But to see a, uh, it's very unusual for a city this size to be so uniform in its architecture. And that makes it really um, very enjoyable uh, to walk around if you, if you are interested in that style, um, because there are just countless examples of gorgeous, gorgeous Art Nouveau. with beautiful decorations. Um, in addition to tourism, um, it is actually one of Norway's biggest fishing ports, um, mostly herring. Um, and there's also a furniture industry um, in Olesund, as well as a very well-regarded aquarium, uh, which is a little further out if you go out onto the peninsula. As you head north out of Olesund, um, we crossed um, another fjord called the Midfjorden, uh, which is very wide, to a town called Molde. Um, here we are on the car ferry. And the views around this particular fjord are really awe-inspiring. Um, and Molde, which is another town about the same size, maybe 30,000 people or so, but very, very different from Olesund. And there's a historic reason for that. Um, it's very modern. Um, here you can see there's a conference center that they built um, a couple of decades ago that's supposed to recall a sailboat um, down on the, on the waterfront. Um, but the reason Molda is uh, so much more modern is that it suffered a very different kind of disaster, this one man-made. Uh, Molda was completely firebombed during uh, World War II by the Nazis. And um, almost the entire city was destroyed. So um, it's kind of at the bottom, I'll show you that in a minute, but um, one of the reasons to stop here is the views are incredible. Uh, the town is actually right down on the waterfront of the fjord, but there is a hill behind it um, and you can either drive to the top or, or hike for an absolutely incredible panoramic view 
Uh, here, you, here's a better view of the modern town of Molda down below. Um, but there is a panoramic view all the way around um, where they say you can count over 200 uh, mountain peaks if you know what you're counting. Um, but again, in 1940, this was a beautiful historic town, mostly wood. Um, it didn't suffer an earlier fire, so it was still a wooden town. Um, but um, German air raids set off fires that completely destroyed the town. Um, so it was built unlike Olesen, was, which was built fortunately during the Art Nouveau period. Um, Molde was rebuilt post-war, so it was a very different architectural style and it tends to be much more um, uh, just that sort of modern 50s, 60s style that's nowhere near as appealing. Um, uh, I think I mentioned at the beginning, people tend to forget that Norway was even involved in World War II because it was so far away. Um, but Nazi Germany occupied what had been a neutral country. Um, and the main reason they were doing that was to try and control access um, from the Atlantic coast um, and also access to iron mines um, in Sweden by working their way all the way around um, because uh, Sweden had um, iron resources that the, the Germans very much needed and wanted to um, protect them. So poor Norway got stuck in the middle of all this. Here I am demonstrating that I made it to the top. And that little inset, is a, there's a cafe. Um, so if you do hike all the way to the top, you can have a nice um, hot coffee and some pastries to celebrate in a quaint little cafe. Um, as you work your way up the coast, the coastal highway, which is the E39, connects um, Christian Sun, which we'll stop at next, uh, or I'm sorry, a different Christian Sun. Christian uh, Christian Sun is in the south, uh, way way south, and it connects all the way to Trondheim. There are seven ferry crossings, um, and there is a very ambitious plan. Um, if you're interested in this kind of um, uh, engineering kind of stuff. Um, there are some fun YouTube videos that you can find where there are documentaries about this project. They, Norway is hoping to spend over the next 30 years or so about 50 billion uh, US dollar equivalents um, to make a continuous road from uh, the furthest south city all the way up to Trondheim um, using either bridges or tunnels, um, so no ferries. Um, and they're trying to replace all of those ferry crossings. It's very complicated um, engineering because not only is it just an enormous distance, but um, most of these fjords are very wide and also extremely deep. So you can't use the traditional tunnel um, and bridge construction that you would use in other places where the water is much, much more shallow. One of the tunnels um, that they're proposing would actually be 16 miles long, one of the longest tunnels in the world. And a number of the tunnels that they are proposing are actually submerged, not tunnels that sit on the bottom of the, um, of the ocean, but tunnels that are actually suspended and float um, in the middle of the water. Um, so it's, it's, it remains to be seen whether they accomplish this. Um, this is a multi-decade project, but um, it's fascinating. And it would ultimately mean that you can drive from the south of um, Norway to Trondheim without ever getting out of your car or getting onto a boat in something like 20 hours, I think, um, 20 hour drive. Um, but even now, this road has some very dramatic stretches um, with bridges like this one right on the edge of the sea. Uh, this part is much closer to the open ocean. And it goes through some beautiful scenery. Here's the little um, island of um, Averroi, which um, has a town called Kvernes on it with a stave church from, believe it or not, this church is from the 1200s. Um, and it is a stave church. Many people um, think that the, the word stave church refers only to those sort of medieval, um, tall, dark, uh, pointy churches. Um, and that is a, a definitely a, a unique style. Um, but 
stave church actually refers to the method of construction, not so much the, the style. So this particular church looks very, very different, um, but is still considered a stave church. And it interestingly has these um, sliding window shutters, um, which are pulled on ropes to protect during storms or bad weather. These actually just slide up in tracks and uh, the, the old glass windows to protect them. Um, here's uh, another one of the big bridges that crosses the fjord to Kristiansund, which is the next place we stopped in. Uh, Christiansund is a kind of gritty um, place. I don't know that you'd spend a lot of time there, but it's um, a great example of a working port. Note that this is different from Christiansund, which is in the south of the country. Um, this is Christiansund. Um, there's about a hundred, little over a hundred thousand people here. Um, it is very much a working port, uh, big in shipping and also big in ship building and ship repairing. So there's a number of dry docks um, where you can see that kind of work going on. And it has, uh, this is one of the towns that I mentioned uh, at the very beginning of the program that has a lot of immigrants um, because this is a major um, and, uh, debarkation, embarkation point for uh, workers who are going to the offshore oil rigs. So there's a surprising number of people from countries all over the world, Poles, Vietnamese, Iraqis, Chileans, Somali, um, an odd mix of people who are coming here um, for what are very difficult but very highly paid positions um, in the oil industry. This is also another one of the cities that was bombed um, in World War II, although not quite as badly, so there's still some, uh, some older buildings and is now, um, in addition to shipping, is also a fishing port for, uh, it's a big fish processing place, mostly for dried salted cod. Um, this is the view from our hotel at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I think actually I saw a um, one of the, I've lost whether it was in the chat or in the, um, uh, in the Q&A, but someone was asking about Northern Lights. Um, and certainly you can see the Northern Lights in Norway at certain times of year and in certain places, um, but not in summer because there's basically no darkness. Um, the sun does go, go below the horizon um, until you get over the Arctic Circle. However, um, even when we were there, which was late May, early June, um, the sun goes below the horizon, but it never really gets dark, dark. So like from maybe three o'clock to five o'clock, it's kind of twilighty. Um, but again, as you can see here, this is two o'clock in the morning and it's definitely not dark enough to even see stars, let alone Northern Lights. So if you want the Northern Lights, the best um, thing to do is to definitely go in the winter. Um, and the problem of course, with traveling in the winter is it's dark. <laughs> It's also cold, so um, you'll get a very different experience um, that is has its own charms, but is very different. Um, one of the best ways I've heard to see the Northern Lights is actually to go to Iceland, because um, Iceland is a lot closer. You can you can hop a plane from Boston to Reykjavik in like four hours, um, and you can take uh, three or four days in Reykjavik. Um, and you have a very good chance of seeing the Northern Lights then. Um, and we headed um, to our final destination on the trip, which was to go through some of the beautiful pastoral countryside to Trondheim. Here's some, some typical churches along the way. Um, this unassuming view, I had to make a literary pilgrimage, um, is the site of the fictional Husabi estate. I don't know if any of you have ever plowed through um, Kristen Lavrens' daughter, which is a trilogy of historical novels written in the early 20th century by Sigrid Unset, who um, won the Nobel Prize for Literature um, back in the 1920s. Um, it's incredibly long. I think it's it's well over a thousand pages. Um, but I I plodded through it on my way um, around Norway, and it actually it's a beautiful story. 
it takes place in the 14th century. Uh, it was written in the 20th century, but the story is all about medieval Norway. So it's actually um, a very beautiful, fascinating story. Um, and it is, of course, entirely fictional, um, but there was a medieval estate um, on this site here that uh, the author based part of her story on. Um, and there's nothing left of the estate um, except a little bit of the foundation, but um, it was kind of fun to go. And having read about this uh, fictional story, um, it was kind of fun to go and imagine to actually see the real place where it might have where the fictional story would have taken place. It put it, makes it come alive a little bit more. And so we're gonna finish in Trondheim, which is the third largest city in Norway, um, about 200,000 people and also very, very old. It was founded in 997 um, and is now a uh, kind of the gateway to the North uh, where Norway gets skinny um, and goes up the coast. Um, but it has um, a major science and technology university. So it's very got a very young population. It was actually the capital of Norway um, during the, the Viking period. Um, and just to, uh, for comparison's sake, the latitude of Trondheim is about the same as Nome, Alaska. So it's, it's pretty far up, but it's still below the Arctic Circle. Um, but it is kind of considered the gateway it's the last big city um, before Norway becomes very narrow and just a single road that goes all the way up to the, the Finnish and Russian borders. Um, but it's a beautiful city. It has a lot of lovely parks, um, another place with a gorgeous waterfront um, and many historic buildings, including this one. This is the back and here's the front um, of the Stiftsgarten which is a former royal residence. Actually, I think it's still used as a royal residence. Um, uh, built in the 18th century, it has 140 rooms, and it is one of the largest entirely wooden buildings anywhere in Europe. Um, and like some of the other places we've seen along the way, it's another city with canals, a lot of old industrial buildings back when it was a big shipping port, um, modern residences, um, museums, lots of boardwalks, very beautiful city, very clean. Um, and with a nice mix of very um, modern buildings and also older ones here. Um, here is a hotel. Um, I think this, is this the one we, yeah, we stayed in this hotel actually, um, which was um, a nice Art Nouveau building. Uh, even the post office and the bank. Um, have beautiful Art Nouveau. But the highlight of Trondheim is the cathedral, um, which is kind of surprising because you don't really see this in Norway. Nidaros Cathedral, uh, Nidaros is the old name for, for Trondheim, and it refers to the fact that um, it is at the mouth of the Neat River. Nidaros means mouth of the Neat. Um, and this building, um, unusual for, unusually for Scandinavia, um, is a genuine Gothic cathedral like the kinds that you might see in France or uh, Germany or England. It was built starting in the year 1070, and it is considered the world's northernmost medieval cathedral. And the west front, which you can see here, is, is certainly the highlight. Absolutely stunning. Um, Many of the sculptures um, have are, are actually replicas because um, they have removed some of the ones that were deteriorating and put them in the um, adjacent museum, which is well worth a visit. Uh, there's Adam and Eve with their fig leaves. Um, and if you have time, absolutely visit the, the Bishop's Palace, which is this structure um, immediately. Uh, adjacent to the cathedral, which um, has a museum, uh, an art museum, and also a number of uh, historic works and sculptures from the cathedral throughout its history. And there's a pretty bridge across the river to the old town neighborhood um, called Backland, Backland um, over the, the water that goes behind the city. The bridge was built in the 1680s and um, was reconstructed a couple hundred years later. So this is a this is a reconstruction. 
And you can see here the warehouse buildings along the river, very similar in style to the ones we've seen all the way along. Um, obviously, this would have been a very busy shipping area with boats unloading, um, loading and unloading things in all of these warehouses. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but um, you'll notice there's a very particular style to all of these warehouse buildings. And that's because um, there's usually a derrick at the top. Um, and what would have happened is the ships would have um, come immediately below and the derrick would have unloaded things directly from the ship into the different levels, storage levels of, um, of the warehouse. And again, most of these warehouses are no longer warehouses. They're, um, they're being used as housing and hotels and other kinds of things, office buildings. Um, the, the backland at district is very pretty. It's um, uh, an old town, mostly pedestrianized area with um, lots of quaint shops and restaurants and guest houses and so forth. Um, and also it's a place where you can climb up to the top and see the original fortress that guards the city um, from the 17th century. Being a librarian, I of course had to stop at the public library um everywhere i go and this one was kind of fun um norway has some very good public libraries in most of its um, larger towns and this is one that was um had a big modern addition built onto it uh, a couple of decades ago and unlike what you would have happened here in massachusetts they found iron age remains <laughs> so the little bridge that when you walk over the front um, the front entrance into from the through the old building into the new modern addition that they built. There's this little bridge, and if you look down the bridge, you will see the remains that they discovered and um, incorporated into the modern library. So it's probably one of the only libraries anywhere, certainly the only one I've ever visited, in, that has graves in the front lobby. Um, but again, Trondheim is full of a mix of new and old buildings. Trondheim did not suffer um, in World War II like a lot of the other um, towns did, so it still has many of its old wooden buildings that remain. Um, and this is the center of the city with um, a statue of Olaf Tryggvason, who was one of the earliest kings a thousand years ago. Another elegant little church. And I'm going to end the program back in Oslo. We took the train all the way back. Um, takes maybe four or five hours of train through gorgeous countryside, all the way back um, Trondheim down to, to Oslo, where we stayed in this guest house completely covered with lilacs. And because the weather was so nice, we made a trip back to Frogner Park in the sunshine instead of in the rain. Um, so here's some of the things we saw earlier in very different light. And it was kind of nice to see uh, with the weather, um, all the Norwegians came out in droves to have picnics in the park and um, enjoy the beautiful summer weather. So I will end the program there and I'm going to stop my, stop my share. And now let's go back and um, if anyone has any questions, I want to make sure that we get to any of them. What is the uh, what is the national dish of Norway? That's a good question. I don't know that, but I bet it's fish. Um, there is, oh, I wish I could remember his name. Um, there's a, a, I think it's on PBS. There was um, a cooking show series that has a chef whose name completely escapes me. I wonder if I can look it up while we're talking here. Um, let's see. Um, but if you don't know much about, um, let's see. Oh yeah, it was called New Scandinavian Cooking. Um, hosted by a guy named Andreas Wiestad. Um, and 
I don't see anything about where. Oh, yes, you can watch it on Amazon Prime. Um, so it's called New Scandinavian Cooking. And um, it was actually kind of fascinating because so people know so little about Scandinavian cooking and cuisine, um, but they uh, they went around and they did a lot of the cooking outdoors <laughs> in, you know, beautiful. Uh, beautiful scenery, and then demonstrated dis different kinds of dishes that um, many of which are completely unknown to us because we just don't, it's not a very popular uh, cuisine in restaurants and stuff like that. Um, someone's mentioning that it's still on PBS, which I think is where I saw it originally. Um, but the, the thing I see on the internet is you can also watch it on Prime Video as well, so that um, if you're interested in the um, cooking and also some scenery, because I remember there were lots of beautiful scenery um, in the programs as well. Um, so I don't know if there is a national dish for Norway, but I would bet it has something to do with fish. Um, and now let's go back to the Q&A. Let's see. Someone's going to Oslo next week. Nice time to be there and an expedition voyage around Svalbard. Wow. Um, that sounds adventurous. Shelly is asking, hi, Shelly. <laughs> I haven't talked to you in a long time. Um, what ends up being the most expensive part of the trip? Is it lodging, transportation, or food? Yes, all of those. Um, lodging is I, I tend to stay in relatively inexpensive places when I travel and it's rare for me to travel in Europe and stay in a place that's like for me 150 US dollars a night for a hotel is splurging um, and most times I would spend less than 100 US dollars a night um, and um when we got there, I, I don't think we found, th there was nowhere to stay that was less than 200 or $250 a night. And that this was a number of years ago. Um, in fact, to the point where I think we had avoided taking the Hürtegruten because we thought it would be expensive. And when you factor in the cost of a rental car, the cost of food and the cost of lodging, um, the coastal, cruise line is actually not a bad deal because that's all included. Um, so I, I would encourage you to actually think about that. It's probably, um, it, it could end up being cheaper. Food was very expensive. In fact, um, we were there for three weeks and I remember being literally in tears the first night we were in Oslo because, oh, we're here, we're on vacation. We went out, um, our guidebook recommended a particular neighborhood that had great restaurants. And we started walking up and down the street and we're so horrified by how much it was going to cost to eat. And we, all we could think of was, we're here for three weeks, we're going to starve. Um, we ended up in, a, in an Italian restaurant in Oslo where we got um, a small pasta dish, a salad, and bottled water. And it was 40 US dollars per person. And again, this is several years ago. Um, it was easily twice that per person to get an ordinary restaurant meal with a glass of wine. Um, so we found that um, in many places we ate um, either street food or we would go to 7-Elevens, which are much nicer in Norway than they are here. And you could get a shrink wrapped sandwich and a piece of fruit and a bottle of water for like 20 US dollars and we would eat it in our hotel room. Um, so um, things change, obviously. Uh, and actually, the exchange rate, um, I don't know what it is with us and the Norwegian krona, but this is, for the first time in 20 years, the, uh, the US dollar, and the EU, the, the euro are actually almost exactly the same. So this might actually be a very good time to be going to Scandinavia because um, we were there at the exact worst time. It was like... It was like 50% higher there. Um, but in general, accommodations are expensive. Gasoline is expensive if you're renting a car. It, it's just an expensive place to travel. Um, so 
that doesn't mean it's not worth it. And it it is one of the most beautiful places I've ever traveled and um, fun, clean, safe, gorgeous, varied. I, I can't speak highly enough of it, but um, cost is definitely something you have to plan for and, and be prepared for. Um, and the last thing, um, um, a copy of my itinerary. I can certainly tell you, what, uh, I can give Robert an itinerary of where we went. Um, the particular inns and hotels we stayed in, I've long since forgotten because this was a number of years ago and they may not even necessarily be there anymore. Um, but I can certainly give a list of all of the uh, places where we where we went to. Um, blah blah blah. Taxes, yes. Norway has high taxes, which definitely adds. Oh, this actually reminds me. Speaking of money, one of the things that that we um, started to do because we realized even the Norwegians did it. Um, we stayed in a number of hotels that had fantastic buffet breakfasts with pickled herring and smoked herring and creamed herring and all kinds of breads and uh, yogurt and cheeses and cold cuts, and um, which was a good way to stock up and get one good meal that was part of your um, part of what you had already paid for. Um, but I was surprised to see how many Norwegians. Um, in many cases, they were they were traveling on business, and they showed up with Tupperware. And you know, it's expensive even for Norway. Of course, their their incomes are higher, but still, it, it's expensive for everybody. So they would they would go to the breakfast buffet, make sandwiches, pile stuff into their Tupperware, and go off for the day, um, and get a free lunch out of that. So once we saw the locals doing that, we we got the hang of it and started doing the same thing. Um, someone's mentioning that they love Bergen. Uh, reindeer steak. I have had reindeer, but not in Norway. I've actually had it in Canada. Uh, but I think, I think I've hit all of the, what year? I, let's see, what year was it? It was David's 40th. So that would have been, it was just about 10 years ago just about so i think if that's all the questions um as i said um when when robert sends out information as a follow-up tomorrow um he can include my email so if anybody has um any additional questions about this program or anything else um do feel free i'm to i'm happy to answer questions personally so uh, feel free to contact me that way and i'll do what I can to find out, particularly if it's something I have to look up. I can do a little research and get back to you. Jeff may be retired, but you can't take the reference librarian out of him. He likes nope. like doing his research. <laughs> uh, so Jeff, wonderful job uh, as usual. Uh, folks, as Jeff said, look for that email tomorrow, feedback survey, recording, uh, Jeff's email address, and uh, hopefully some information about some of uh, Jeff's upcoming talks with us. And um, I apologize at one point I had lost connection, Jeff, and I was oh, gone that's for okay. minutes. So hopefully that didn't mess up the recording. But anyway, thank you all so much. And uh, we'll see you uh, sometime next month for another virtual uh, armchair travel presentation. So okay. have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.